I'm Emily, I'm 33, I live in Cambridge. I'm a midwife and a mum of a little two-year-old girl called Annie. Um, I've been a midwife for 11 years, I think it is now. I, started, I was sort of qualified when I was 22, did three years before that. Um, come from a really big family that's all based in Cambridge. I'm married, um, I've been married for almost five years. So I've always worked as a full-time midwife, doing a real mixture of sort of day and night shifts. Um, but since having my daughter, my kind of priorities changed. And um, although I wanted to keep up my sort of career, um, I really wanted to be able to spend a lot more time with her. I've always wanted to be a midwife. I was my sister's birthing partner when I was um, 17 and really kind of helped her through those last bits and just seeing all the midwives working around her, I just thought it was actually something that I'd really be able to do. There's a definite baby boom happening at the moment but there isn't enough midwives to kind of deal with that. We're constantly short-staffed, we're moving midwives from one area to another, um, we're getting community midwives in, um, where the real thing really is that there isn't enough midwives. There seems to be a lot of midwives going through um, training, but there's not the jobs at the end of the day. So we're, you know, we're investing all this time and this energy and passion in all these young girls, and not many of them are getting jobs. I've, I know girls that, from locally with three children, having to you know, drive 200 miles off to, to get a job, work there in the week and come back, and yeah, there's just not, the, the jobs aren't there, basically. I feel worried for the NHS um, and for the people that are working in it. Um, and I think they do a really, really good job. And I think you're working on people's good nature. Um, I just can't see where they can make these cuts without the service really taking a nosedive. So whether or not that's a way of, of doing it to say, OK, the NHS isn't working, we need to privatise parts of it. I'm not saying it's true. I'm saying, is it possible that cuts to the NHS, public discrediting of the NHS, making it difficult to get good service in the NHS, will push people in? Is it possible that that can push people yeah, I suppose, yeah. I think it's making people feel that they're not getting a quality service from the NHS and they're kind of, if you've got a little bit of money to actually go private, you're going to get, you know, better care. Just real sensationalised headlines that are coming out at the moment um, with Jeremy Hunt saying, you know, you're more likely to die if you go into hospital at weekends, um, saying that doctors need to start working 24, you know, 24 seven, seven days a week. Um, just really sensationalised, which I feel like the whole media is at the moment, um, and sort of scaring people further, because um, some people don't research things themselves. They don't, you know, get, look at a variety of sort of different media. Um, they're just sort of kind of spoon-fed and take on board what's being sort of told to them because obviously politicians don't lie. Politicians don't, you know, sort of bend the truth or anything like that. As soon as the coalition government was elected in 2010, it took an axe to the welfare budget. It took an axe to the local government budget. It took an axe to all the other areas of social spending. It privatised, it cut. With Adam Brooks turning away non-emergency patients because its A&E department can't cope with demand, but if you can get inside, the regulator says you can expect outstanding care from its staff, only there aren't enough of them to keep patients safe. Louise. I'm a mum of four and full-time nurse. I work as a junior sister at Addenbrooke's Hospital on a busy surgical ward. So I qualified as a nurse in 2009. The, the number of patients that our ward holds has increased. Our ward grew from a 26-bed ward to a 32-bed ward. Um, to cover that, they've increased the number of staff 
except on a night shift we've still only got two healthcare assistants to cover the same number of patients as we did were there before and it's still the same. Um, that's harder and you notice that because the workload's increased but actually the staff numbers haven't necessarily. We just have to cope with the number of people that are coming in because as well as my post on the ward as a junior sister I also hold a bleep for the division of um, one division within the hospital and when I'm holding the bleep I'm also moving people um, making beds, making space. So if um, A&E are like packed and there's no room in the hospital, I have to shift people that are less acute to less acute areas and move in people that are more ill. Um, and that's quite a lot of strain because on top of all the work that the nurses have got to do, they've also got to somehow factor in the time it takes to move the patient off of the ward somewhere else to make room for someone coming in. People have bedded down in A&E before, you know, when it's got when it's got like that. I don't think that happens very often. But we, you, know, you, you open the contingency areas. And the trouble when you open a contingency area, say in the middle of a shift, you're then saying, right, we'll open that area as a ward. We'll take a nurse from that ward, a nurse from that ward, and an HCA from that ward to cover it. So you're actually spreading the staff thinner across the hospital. You know, when you're actually holding the bleep and you're communicating with the matrons, and they're saying, you know, a and jam-packed, we're full up here, we've got to open a contingency area. You're feeling like it's all being spread a little bit thin, you know. Um, and then we, we've had meetings with the matron and other division hold, bleep holders where actual patient safety has been an issue. I've seen nurses crying on shift. You know, I've been looking after their division and I've gone down to help them with something and they're just, you know, crying because they can't cope with, you know, what they've got. One nurse looking after maybe ten poorly patients. I don't think there's room for any more cuts. It doesn't feel like there's room for any more cuts. I don't know where they would cut from. We all work, you know, from start to, to finish at shift. We all work at 100 miles an hour for the entire period of that time. Um, you know, from a staffing point of view, you can't do any more than that. And you know, even then, working at 100 miles an hour for 12 and a half hours, you still don't always go home feeling like you've given everybody everything they need. We have just fought for a 1% pay rise. Um, for the first time, midwives actually went on strike. Um, there were two, two times that they, they went on strike, um, but apparently the government said we can strike as much as we like, we're not getting any more than our 1%. Um, so we've had a massive pay freeze for over the last kind of five years. It's demoralising really. So I qualified six years ago and I don't think we've had a pay rise other than our um, progression, salary progression. We've not had any pay rise in that time. So when I started as a newly qualified nurse, we started on 21,000 something. Now, if you start as a newly qualified nurse, you still start on 21,000 something. So actually, the starting wage for a nurse hasn't changed since I started six years ago. I can't see how they can expect us to care for this volume of women without investing more midwives because it's unsafe it's getting really unsafe and you just feel each shift you've got off and you're like Phew. the upcoming pay freeze is going to just devalue the job even more you know how can we continue to not have pay rises year on year but we're powerless to do anything about it we you know what can you do other than you just at the mercy of the politicians aren't you because while we're working at 100 miles an hour for 12 and a half hours and they're sleeping in the back benches getting themselves a nice little 10% pay rise. Well, I think the NHS is struggling and it's, on, it's, at, it's at breaking point. You know, it's been quite clearly covered up um, as to how bad the NHS is at the moment. But I think it's, it's struggling to cope. And I think that money does need to be put into these services, into our schools, into our health service, into our public services in general to help look after us all.